So hello, everybody. Um, it is December 19th, and we have a treat in store for you. Uh, I'm going to introduce Julia Cho, and she's going to talk about, she's going to help us understand how to bring the human touch to to our e-learning environments, you know, bringing the instructor into our e-learning environments. Um, Julia uh, is a She's the lead faculty for the Master of Technical Communication program at Northeastern University. She is a professor at Northeastern University, but she has also worked um, in business as a professional technical writer and editor in the computer industry, for, and that's been for over uh, 20 years. She holds a master's in applied linguistics from UMass Boston, a grad certificate in technical writing from Northeastern University, a bachelor's in English from UMass Amherst, and she's currently working on her educational doctorate at Northeastern University. So without further ado, Julia, make us smarter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, yep, so this is the human touch, um, learning how to bring instructor presence into e-learning. And uh, the whys, not just the hows, but why is this important, uh, especially if you are someone who is either new or learning how to improve um, your e-learning courses. So Vicki already gave me an awesome intro. Um, I just add that uh, my corporate experience uh, has been with many different computer companies um, where I did touch upon some training here and there. Um, but I actually did start out in education as a teacher way back uh, when I graduated in 91. And I've come full circle back to um, being in education. And I recently took on a position here at Northeastern as a technical writer, so I have married everything all together in one place. Um, and it's, it's actually a lot of fun to be here in an academic environment doing technical writing because um, it's a lot like R&D and um, they're actually bringing me into more uh, of a training role as well within the research computing group to get people up to speed on that kind of, of uh, technology here at Northeastern, um, because we are now a tier one research university. So uh, research computing is uh, just a, a really big component of uh, many researchers work here. Okay. So this particular webinar, uh, I'm just going to have a little intro about what we're going to be going over. Um, we will have why this is an important topic, um, the hows of, of improving uh, instructor presence, uh, what kind of outcomes you can get from this improvement, and some key takeaways, uh, and then time for questions. Okay, so with an e-learning environment, I think that the overwhelming feeling is that this is something that is controlled by robots, that uh, your audience as well as uh, the instructor just aren't going to be connected, um, that there's, there's going to be all of these issues, there's going to be technical issues. So the e-learning environment, I think for many people is still kind of this mysterious thing that happens in the cloud and and many people have a lot of anxiety going into an e-learning environment um, and e-learning is not new and many researchers have been looking into how do we improve this uh, this environment the e-learning environment so that it is optimal for learners. Um, and obviously, as more and more universities and more and more private companies move into the e-learning space, this has become a really important topic because of um, outcomes, meaning did anyone actually learn anything, and retention. Um, a lot of people start an e-learning course and they drop it. Um, and we'll get to that section a little bit uh, later in the outcomes, but 
it is important that uh, we are building our e-learning with this human element in it. So just to go over why this is important in terms of the learner. One of the key things that, um, especially at the beginning of, of an e-learning experience is that feeling of, of isolation, that you're the only person there, that you, you don't know how to reach out for help. Um, I can remember back in 1999, taking an e-learning course where you had to log in using a telnet and it, it, it kind of gave that sort of, uh, does, you know the the i the idea that you're you're just typing stuff on a screen and maybe someone's responding maybe they're not um, but one of the factors that that came out of the research is that learners feel isolated in these e-learning environments especially towards the beginning Second is anxiety, uh, and that comes out of feel that feeling of isolation. So now you're sitting there, now you actually have something due, now you have, have a, an assignment or something that you need to complete, and the feeling is, I don't know where to go, I don't know how to do this, and maybe I don't even know how to ask for help. Um, those are basically the, the two main factors that can contribute to a learner dropping out of an um, e-learning course. Um, and these are the factors that um, we try to address by bringing that human element into our e-learning environment. And the theory that really has uh, resonated and been investigated uh, a lot over the past um, more than 10 years now, I was going to say 10 years, but I think it's more than 10 years now, now that it's almost 2020, um, was the Community of Inquiry Framework. Uh, this is actually a, a smaller diagram, this is like the, the core diagram, where within uh, an e-learning course, if you're building instructor presence, and this isn't just uh, video. Okay, we're talking about instructor presence throughout a course, through constructing the course by, by being personal, by bringing personal touches into um, different parts of the course material. So instructor presence can be generated, not just by someone talking into a video. Um, social presence is uh, when the participants start to identify with the course, with the other people in the course, if, if they're running it with other people. So the social presence is, is on the part of the participant. The cognitive presence is when participants start making meaning from the material that the instructor is providing. And all of these things together help to make an educational experience that is ideal that helps to reduce that feeling of isolation, that helps to reduce the feelings of anxiety, and also improves the out learning outcomes as well as retention. Okay, so how do we bring the human into e-learning? Um, there's actually several ways, as I mentioned, in terms of instructor presence. Um, one thing that I think is overlooked um, sometimes when we're designing a course um, is the fact that when you create course materials, when you create uh, discussion threads, when you are creating anything that goes into an e-learning course, you really should be trying to use your own voice. You should really be trying to use you. Um, and you should be trying to directly address the learner. Um, so within a discussion board, as you can see from the, the top, that is uh, part of a Blackboard discussion board. Um, 
you know, I will always try to respond as quickly as possible to people, even if it's sometimes a response that says, thanks for bringing this up, I will look into it. Um, that's facilitating the course if you have a live course or a course that's running over several weeks. Um, it's funny too, because in terms of courses that are archived, um, for example, you can see courses that are archived at MIT and you can actually see the discussions that have been archived. And I've noticed that people will interact sometimes with the older discussion threads because they've looked at this human to human communication and they've identified with it. They're like, oh, so a student asked a question, an instructor responded. So facilitation in, in some cases, even if it's quote unquote archived or it's you know several weeks old, it's actually still valuable. Um, in terms of giving directions in e-learning, uh, it, it really has to be very concrete. It really has to be crystal clear. Um, and it's okay to personalize. Like sometimes I, I put cartoons up um, uh, on, on the, on my assignment pages, you know, or have little jokes, uh, that I've identified as jokes. I hope they think they're jokes. Um, but just to try to bring an element of myself and how I would be presenting or how I would be giving direction in an on ground or face to face live class. So my takeaway from this for everyone, if you're designing an e-learning course, don't be afraid to be you. Um, just make sure that you have someone else to review it to make sure that you're, you're being, um, uh, you know, aware of your audience uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, the gender issue or sexuality issue that you are being still uh, a PC kind of person, but at the same time, don't be afraid to express who you are through your course materials. So Julia, we have a, a comment in the chat box from Michael. He, sure. says, he says the challenge with discussions is getting students to go back to engage in conversation beyond the required posts. Sure. Um, and that is something that you wanna look back on and say, what are my requirements? Uh, and that goes back to course design. Um, if you've required two posts and they have to be at a certain time and a certain, that's what they're going to do. Um, in terms of how you want them to engage, if you want them to go back and, and be chatty, you also have to understand that you are dealing with other human beings. Some people are not chatty at all, even in, even in a, a, a regular classroom. So in that, uh, and as someone actually pointed this out to me uh, recently, because they were taking a course, uh, they had just completed a course this winter, and on the discussion board, they actually complained about one of the, the students who would answer everybody, you know, and back again, and, and they must have had like 20 or 30 posts per week. Because <laughs> they just kept answering everybody and everything. So within your design, within your course design, if it is important for you to encourage this type of discussion, then you want to make that clear to your students that they're going to get rewarded. Um, also on the back end, if you are doing any kind of assessment in terms of discussion, you wanna do that as well. So I always give a weekly assessment to each individual student. And I might say something like, great work on the discussion board. I love the engagement, keep it up. So you wanna, you wanna give them that little carrot. Obviously, if they're just discussing to perform and to get that minimal um, discussion board post requirements in, you are gonna have those students that just do that, period. And that's okay, uh, if that's what you've designed the course to be like. Uh, if you do want to make sure that you are encouraging beyond, 
then that's the human part of you. That's the interaction where you go to a person who you think we might be able to be a discussion leader and say, hey, great job. You know, I'd love to hear more from you next week. Um, so that, that's part of the design and facilitation part of it as, as uh, in terms of the course. Uh, did that help answer? Let's see if he says anything here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. It says performance quality goals, uh, academic quality con contribution, peer engagement, and frequency. So what he says. Yep. Feedback promotes increased engagement. Amen to that. It does. It does. Honestly, it does. Um, but again, if you if if this is something that's important to you, put it in your design and put it in the direction, you know, say, here's your minimum, I would love to see more. So that's your direction. If you're if you're if you want them to go beyond what is required in the minimum, because um, otherwise they're, they, they're, they're not going to take the direction <laughs> and they want their carrot. They, they want their little pat on the head, they want it, and they deserve it. You know, if they've made these posts and they've done a good job, they deserve it. Okay, let's uh, move on if we're okay. Good discussion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so an easy way, in my opinion, to add real instructor presence uh, that students do like to consume is, uh, is video and they don't have to be um, high tech, glossy, green screen, um, you know, things floating around your head. Uh, you could do that if, if, if this appeals to you and you have the technology to do that. Um, more often than not, I am just doing really quick stuff. Occasionally my cats will come up and be like, why aren't you feeding us? <laughs> Um, I think all of my students have seen my cats at this point. And uh, it's, it's again, to, to give that little bit of humanness. Um, I think shorter videos uh, have been shown to be better than longer ones. In other words, if you're, re if you're recording a lecture, um, I've, I've read different studies that say it's better to break it down into chapters. So because one 45 minute video could just as a lecture be too much for someone to consume all at once. And by putting it into chapters, you um, help to break that down for the viewer uh, and they can find things more easily within the video as well. Because video of course is, it's hard to be searchable in a video. It is, uh, you, you can, um, but yeah, the shorter videos uh, help to, to circumvent that and using chapters, if you have a longer video, again, helps to, to break it down for people so they can skip around. Um, in conjunction with using video, um, uh, th th this is a little bit of a time sink depending on what you're teaching and uh, the type of feedback you're providing, you can take a video of you as you have someone's paper on the screen and be giving them verbal feedback as if it were a writing conference. I'm more going to actually do a live conference with students because I teach a lot of writing classes. So I'm more apt to say, hey, why don't we schedule some time? We can sit down, we'll put it up, you put your paper up on the screen and we'll go through it. I do turn on my video, my video driver cards are working. Um, and so they can see me as if we we're sitting down and having a, going to a coffee shop and having a writing conference there. Recording it is, uh, is also very effective. There uh, was a short study that did show that, especially in terms of giving a student constructive feedback, 
uh, a short video going through and saying, here's things you need to fix, here's things I'd like to see, um, actually really improve the student's outcome in terms of producing something um, that was more refined and more in line with what the course objective was, as opposed to just making comments on a paper. Now, obviously, doing a multimodal approach in terms of grading or correcting a paper um, is a time sink, but maybe it's more valuable in an early draft stage. Um, it is something to, to kind of think about as you're trying to incorporate different ways of uh, bringing yourself closer to your students. Okay, so we're just going to go over a couple of the main uh, outcomes that are um, that research has shown uh, using instructor presence and creating social presence uh, has really had an effect on in terms of e-learning classrooms. And the two main things are engagement and retention. Uh, it was actually one of the studies I have in the material towards the end of the, um, at the end of, of the presentation. Um, was a study that showed uh, using the community of inquiry framework and designing a course around instructor presence uh, had a positive impact on retention. Um, and this is important, I think, for a lot of e-learning um, courses or even e-learning that's uh, like not within a university training courses uh, is really to get people to engage with the material and get through all of the material and make it out of the e-learning course uh, with a positive learning outcome that makes them want to come back and do it again. So adding all of those things to your course um, as a as a whole, uh, can take some time. To be honest, uh, these are things that you might need to always be refining, um, and coming back to uh, and saying, "Well, this didn't work very well. I need to fix that." Um, but as we improve our courses and as we improve uh, how we are engaging. Um, we are improving our retention uh, out and outcomes. And those of you who've been in e-learning for you know, several years, I think going back maybe a couple of decades now, um, retention was uh, terrible. I mean, it would, people would just drop out. Uh, to, like that was one of the bigger problems uh, with e-learning. So one of the more positive aspects of having all of this research and these studies done is to show, oh, really, we can fix this. You know, we can make e-learning a rich, meaningful experience for our students. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to pause a little bit here. I realize I've, I've probably been kind of running through this. Uh, did we have any other questions for this? So yes, actually, during that okay. session, we got a lot of feedback from Michael. Um, student drop off with recordings is a problem, he says, even with 10 minute videos. I provide class notes in a Word doc, um, not a PowerPoint, to help guide through the hour and a half live weekly lessons and require discussion posts summarizing, oh, nice, and reacting to what was learned for participation if they didn't attend live. That's a great idea. Students do love the video paper review. Yeah, like you were demonstrating before. Yep. Take lots, takes lots of time for the Take professor. Takes lots of time, yes. Yes, um, because it has to be one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, 
and and there's prep and there's making the recording and then the upload. Um, then he says engagement must be set up as a higher level thinking activity, not something to check a box or get the right answer on a, for the task. Some students don't want to work at this level. Others love engaging and being challenged. <laughs> Michael says, sorry, I'm chatty. I love your chattiness, Michael. Keep, keep it up. And Jamie says, great idea with the class notes and um, non-live participation, Michael. So Jamie's giving feedback. Which is yeah. what we're learning today is very important. It, yes, yeah, all kinds of feedback, short, long. Um, I, I think a couple things to to point out is with our, our the, the the fact that when when we're creating materials, um, we we do need to understand our audience. In other words, there's there's a little bit of UX going on um, in terms of e-learning course materials. And quite frankly, some people don't like watching videos, believe it or not. Um, and it's it's not that your videos aren't engaging or, you know, there are just people who just don't like watching videos. So there can be drop off, obviously. You always want to try to provide some kind of transcript. Um, there should always be ADA compliance with uh, any type of sound or video. Um, but yeah, giving different types of materials other than just video um, is very important, as I pointed out in course design. You don't want to just have video. That is not adding instructor presence if people aren't watching them. So by having that multimodal approach, uh, and multimodal learning meaning having both written word, spoken word, visuals um, to really reach all kinds of learners. Um, in terms of the students that aren't going to engage, um, having worked both on ground for many years and online, um, we do need to understand that we we have a variety of people in our classrooms and we do have the learners who simply want to consume and provide the minimal of what they're required and leave <laughs> and those are the people who in a classroom environment sit at the back they come in you know 30 seconds before the bell and are exiting as the bell is ringing to leave. Um, so with e-learning, we are trying to, we are truly trying to engage people in a rich environment. But of all of the learners that we have, we do have to understand that there just are those personality types for whom in person or online, they're going to behave in the same manner. And that's not a reflection of what we're providing them. It is simply a reflection of the type of learning environment that they want to construct for themselves. Um, the, the true point is that previously, you know, many years ago when e-learning was sort of in its infancy, so to speak, um, we weren't really providing as much human presence or creating social uh, environments for people to engage in. Um, and now that we have that understanding and that knowledge that that does help to engage, you know, the 90% of people that, that are looking to be engaged, uh, that's where um, those are the people that we are truly reaching and changing in terms of how they perceive e-learning. So let me, let, we've had some more discussion here. Let's see. Um, yeah, so Jamie says she always appreciates a video transcript. Yes. Yes, yes. because there are times that she doesn't have time to, or an inclination to watch the video, which is sometimes yes. slower to consume. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Michael says um, that he has tried asking students to post videos in discussions. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It takes too much time. Okay. Yeah, it takes too much time for participants to watch and prepare their own, and you can't skim a video, which is true. There's that, but it, from students, especially I, I, my focus is adult learners. Um, as I've found for many students, um, it's quote unquote risky. It's risky to show your face. It's risky to show your, or have an accent. It's risky to bring your presence, your video presence. So um, video, uh, I find it, it's not just a time sink, especially with adults. Uh, it can also be um, taking a risk and letting other people see that you're a human. Yep. And we were talking about that at the rehearsal yesterday, right? It's just, it's, it's in our nature to type in the chat window rather than turn on a <laughs> microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and Michael has one more comment that he, he'd like to share. Um, group work promotes engaged, high level uh, thinking okay. and okay. collaboration. But yep. his school is struggling with those who simply won't hold up their end in the collaborative yep. assignments. Yeah. So you want to see my other webinar? <laughs> Uh, which is uh, group work in asynchronous classrooms, I think was the title of it. Um, I presented that a couple of times at a couple of conferences. Uh, that was actually a really fascinating topic for me. I researched that several years ago when I started teaching because I love doing group work. Um, and translating it to an e-learning course was super challenging mm. super challenging and so one of the things i'll take a shortcut here and say if you have a wiki where you can or any kind of of system that can track when people contribute and how much they've contributed to the group project such as a google doc or you know one of those shared resources that carefully keeps track of everybody on it um, then it clearly shows who's done what so if you've let them go off and just say hey form groups and do this in an asynchronous online classroom it doesn't work you have to be very specific and give people uh, the opportunity for peer feedback ungraded there's actually a, a, a a few very good websites about uh, getting peer feedback in group work. Um, I actually have some Excel spreadsheets that uh, let people give feedback in a in a very quick manner, so they just check check boxes. Um, but during a project, you can actually step in and say, "Okay, David, so you're not really, you know, holding up on your end. I can see on the wiki you haven't even participated. That's going to impact your grade and not your group." Sometimes that just lights the fire, okay? And David's like, "Oh, I thought we were all getting a group grade." No, nope, actually, if you're not participating, that will, and you put that in your your grading. Individual participation needs to be shown, and it will be graded. Yeah. So Michael, um, Michael says that the the group work webinar sounds good. Um, <laughs> have you got that recorded anywhere, or do you want to you want to set, set one up for? So that, was, uh, where was that? that was the I think that was one of the teaching and learning groups. I think that was recorded. Um, yeah, maybe I'll I'll, I'll re I haven't actually touched it for a few years. It would be interesting to go back and see what. Uh, what more research has gone into it? Um, yeah, there's some yeah, interest. It is, yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely it does acknowledge the fact that in an on ground situation, oh, these things happen all the time, right? Group projects can just be set on fire. Yeah. Um, but with proper setup, expectations, the design, the facilitation, those parts of it. Um, and giving them the right tool for whatever they're producing so that clearly you can see who's done what in the group. Um, and it's not a big brother thing too, for the person who ends up doing all of the work, trust me, they love being able to say, nope, David didn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> see, 
if you look at the record, not here. So it, 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 for the students, they've, they were great with it. I actually taught uh, wiki-based documentation and that's the way I set it up. And um, students loved it. Cool. They loved the fact that they could do group work in a safe environment and be rewarded for what they did. So Michael says, uh, agrees that you need to have the individual accountability. Mm -hmm. And um, he says that um, group, hang on a minute. He says that the group work um, webinar sounds good. And he also says that he has encouraged his students to see the class as a safe environment and to get yeah. used to right. um, that, right. that they will have, they will have to do that kind of thing in the workplace too. Yep, they absolutely do. And um, in terms of of making a safe space, that's that's another reason why bringing in all of these, designing the human aspect, and actually specifically stating, you know, you, we will not tolerate claiming, we will not tolerate, um, you know, interactions that uh, in in any way might offend any other person in the classroom. Um, and classroom management, stepping in if you do actually see that. Um, in terms of really encouraging other people, a lot of times your own example is the best example. Um, you know, if you're, if you're up there making a video and it's pristine and perfect and wonderful, you're kind of setting that tone. So maybe a, a video that's a little more casual or, you know, something that reflects your, your personality or something in your, your home space that you'd like to share. Um, those can all help to bring those barriers down. Do we have any other questions? So it's currently quiet. Okay. <laughs> oh wait, um, Jamie says she appreciates it that we get to see other personal spaces uh, when we hold the video chats and it really humanizes the experience. Yes, <laughs> and Jamie's cats could be in her, her <laughs> videos too. My cats are hilarious because I will sit down with my microphone and they will come up and like sit in my lap. They're like, oh, it's video time. Um, I, I'm at work, so they're not here. But um, yeah, they, it's, it's pretty hilarious. They, 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 I think that they can hear the other people if I'm chatting. <laughs> um, yeah. And they're probably wondering, does that person have food? Are they going to get me any food? <laughs> so, so Michael says that uh, in addition to the instructor's life, that you need to bring the student's life in to um, be open and human with the students and look for opportunities to have them bring the learning into their own workspace and work life. Uh, <laughs> Michael says he's had a good conversation about cats in a few cats. classes. <laughs> Some of his classes <laughs> like to talk about cats. Uh, Jamie says that her cats actually in <laughs> one, of our, one of our IDL SIG webinar recordings. Yep. Um, never again will I keep the door shut when I'm recording. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, I don't. I don't bother. Um, if I'm doing something that's a recording, I don't want them. I will start a fake recording. I'll just sit down and start talking, and they'll come up, and then they'll go away, and then I'll keep going. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. So they <laughs> have a decoy. They have, right. So they're just, they're just there for a few minutes and they go away. Um, all right. I will just move on to showing um, some of the references. Um, there's actually a lot, a lot more than, than what I do have here. Um, but of particular interest in terms of retention is the one by Boston at all um that one for me i think was was kind of the the one where i was like yeah this is this is what you know we should be really promoting um just to make sure that we're we're 
using the community of inquiry framework uh, to its fullest. And I think if you just Google community of inquiry framework, you will actually even get more resources. Um, I, I believe there's a couple of websites actually now just dedicated to this framework um, because it's it's been really transformative in the way people think about designing and facilitating classes, uh, online e-learning classes. So, and if you're watching this uh, video on YouTube, there will be a link to Julia's slides. Uh, once the YouTube becomes public, there, there will be a link and um, you can go to our website and get the PDF of this so that you don't have to um, frantically try to write this down by hand. <laughs> don't write it down. <laughs> like I said, if, if you Google um, Community of Inquiry Framework, uh, you will get several high quality uh, sites that do have lots of references. Um, it is something that people have uh, investigated, uh, like I said, over the past more than 10 years now, um, and how it can really impact uh, student learning outcomes. Uh, Michael says the Journal of Asynchronous uh, Learning Networks and Online Learning Publications looks very interesting. Yes, they are. Uh, it's, it's, it's not light reading, but um, it, it's, it's really fascinating, the, the, the research that has come out of this one particular framework. Fantastic. So we'll pause here to let every, uh, any further questions be typed into the chat. I want to remind everybody that's on the call that um, you do have microphone rights if you'd like to actually speak up. So um, keep that in mind that um, it, it, it is faster <laughs> if, you, if you speak your question. Um, so, so you're welcome to open up your microphone and um, talk to Julia yourself. Yeah. So Michael says he's at the dissertation phase of his PhD. He's considering looking at the discussions and other engagement opportunities. Yep. Yeah, well, the, the, here's, here's a, the start of your lit review for you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> only, only 300 more references to go. Um, <laughs> that's a daunting daunting phase, very daunting. I, I, I start next year, so yeah, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sympathizing with that. Yep. So while we're waiting for people to um, uh, type any further questions into the chat or uh, continue any further discussion into the chat, I um, just want to thank Julia so much for um, this a very engaging presentation. We did. We had a lot of interactivity today. Um, Jamie says a great webinar, Julia. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Um, and to remind you that uh, IDLC has a number of webinars planned. So um, go to our website and you'll find links to our the webinars that we have in the in the can. And we have some recorded that you can watch for free if you're a member including this one. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having. Um, it is, uh, a, online learning has been a favorite topic of mine since I actually started uh, almost 12 years now, 12 years ago, uh, my first online course. Um, I find it fascinating. Uh, I really do that we can have these rich experiences with people just around the world, uh, really, in terms of online. Um, and anything that we can do to improve students' outcomes uh, is, is always up my alley. And um, I'm very happy that this was useful for people and that you know you did get something out of it. I really do um, encourage people to, to look into it um, if you are doing any kind of uh, e-learning.
Well, all right, then I'm going to um, stop the recording.